Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our annual AP Revision Workshops. This is a series of lectures where today we're going to take you through the entire AP syllabus, including some of the electives. My name is Mark Ancelotti, and I'm going to take you through Lecture 1, which really looks at the algebra of Grade 11. In this first lecture, I'm going to divide into three smaller sections. So we'll look at partial fractions followed by complex numbers. Then we're going to look at inequalities and absolute values, where I'm going to look at both the graphs and solving equations. And then in part three, we'll look at E and the natural logarithm. Now, just remember that this is a revision of grade 11. So I'm not going to be looking at E and the natural log in the context of differentiation or integration. That's going to come much later on during the course of today. Okay, when solving for partial fractions, we get three basic types, where there are linear factors, no repeats, where we have linear factors with repeats, and where we deal with improper fractions. And I'm going to go through a few examples of each of these. Just remember, one of the things that I always do first is to make sure that your fractions are proper, which means the degree of the numerator cannot be more than the degree of the denominator. Okay, where I make reference to some examples, and they have some numbering next to them, so if you look over here at this 1a, um, that is just making reference to questions in your work pack. There is a handout with a whole lot of examples. Please make use of those. Please practice before your exam. There's a full set of solutions with them. So the first thing I want you to recognize about this example is that it's not proper. Okay, so it's not bottom heavy per se. We've got to go and resolve it. And there are a number of ways in which you can write a fraction as a proper fraction. Some of your teachers may have taught you synthetic division. Some of them have taught you long division. I personally prefer a method by inspection where what we do is we just say let's find iterations of the denominator. And what I mean by that is you've got an x squared minus 1. I write it on the top and then I say to myself, all right, if I've got one lot of x squared minus 1, I'm actually too short of getting to the 1 and then I would have added 2 there. So this numerator is actually exactly the same as the numerator of the original. And then I divide each term at the top by the denominator. So I'm going to get x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 1, which gives me this 1. And then 2 over the x squared minus 1, which now I factorize. And then over here, I've given a solution where I'm now going to zoom in. Okay, And we're going to say to ourselves, OK, let's look at the partial fraction of that component and see what that tells us. But I, I just want to have a little bit of fun before we go much further. If you were given this in a different section, and I said to you, let's take the limit as x tends towards infinity, can you remember what you're actually doing right here? What you're doing is you're finding the horizontal asymptote. The limit as x tends towards positive or negative infinity gives you the horizontal asymptotes of a function. And as x tends towards infinity, we know that this component would be 0, and this component over here would be 0. And so if we just look at the graph, what we notice is there's a horizontal asymptote of y is equal to 1, which is that horizontal dotted line. And of course, it makes perfect sense that at x equals 1 and x equals minus 1, where the function is undefined, we also get those asymptotes. And that often is a very nice way of framing the graph. But again, rational functions is coming later on. Let's just look more at the partial fractions and how I got to this part of the partial fractions. Okay, so what we have here are two linear factors. Remember how we go and write it so we can break this down. So the 2 over x minus 1, x plus 1 can be written as a over x minus 1 plus b over x plus 1. And so when we cross multiply so that we can just focus on the numerators, this 2 is equal to a times x plus 1 plus b times x minus 1. And now we're going to use a method called the cover-up method. There are multiple routes that you can take here, and not every teacher uses this method. But the cover-up method is quite a clever way of saying, let's eliminate some unknown so that we can just focus on the A part only or the B part only. So we choose clever values of X. So here I've said let's choose X is equal to minus 1. You see, if X is minus 1, this part of the bracket, this bracket becomes 0, which means the A disappears. So you're getting minus 2b is equal to 2, and you get b is equal to minus 1. And similarly, if you let x equals to 1, what it's going to do over here is it's going to make this entire bracket disappear so that the b has gone, and then you're going to get 2a is equal to 2, and a is equal to 1, 
and then we've got our partial fraction, then you can rewrite this A as 1 up there, and you can rewrite that B as negative 1 over there. So let's look at something a little more complex. We're going to talk about repeated factors here. Please just, I think, important uh, an important skill in the exam is to be able to use your calculator properly. So you don't want to go and do long division over here. If it were me, I would definitely put that into my calculator. I'll get the factor straight away, and I'd recognize here that there is a repeated factor. Please remember, if you get a repeated factor, you have to have every possible iteration of this factor, starting off with the exponent of 1 and building up, in this case, to 2. So if you had an x to the 5, you would have to have an x, an x to the 1, an x to the 2, and so on until I get x to the 5. Okay. So just remember that's what we mean by a repeated factor. So we can rewrite our expression as a over x minus 2 plus b. Now what I do is I say over x plus 3 to the power of 1, over x plus 3 to the power of 2, and I would keep building up. I had a repeated factor, and I have every possible iteration of that. Now I'm jumping ahead, so I'm going quickly, but I'm going to come and explain what I've done now. So if my numerator is over here on the left, a x plus 3 or squared plus b x minus 2 x plus 3, so I've multiplied every single term by the LCD so that I can just compare the numerators to each other. So I'm just playing over here with the numerators. If we think very carefully, I could choose x is equal to 2 because then if x is equal to 2, it makes this bracket 0. It makes that bracket equals to 0. And then substituting x equals 2 into this far side over here on the right and putting x is 2 over there, I'm able to solve for a is equal to 2. And then again, if I choose very carefully and I say to myself, let's choose where x is equal to minus 3. By putting in minus 3, this would become 0. By putting in minus 3, that part becomes 0. And then I can go and solve for the c. And it's not too difficult to show that c would then be equal to 3. And then another clever thing that we sometimes do is we say, let's compare the leading coefficients. You see, if I know when I multiply out this bracket, I'm going to get an x squared. And if I know when I multiply out that bracket, I'm going to get x squared. And I know that the a is 2 already. I can just play with the leading coefficients by saying, this coefficient of a is 2. There's a coefficient b, and I know that I needed to get a coefficient of 1x squared. And so I can rearrange and play around, and I can solve for b. This is a quicker way of being able to solve for your unknowns, but you also are able to substitute any other values of x. For example, x is 1, x is 0, and then you can solve for your unknown. But your teachers may have shown you that this is a very clever way of getting to your answer quickly if you compare the leading coefficients of the x's. Just another little point before I move on. Remember that partial fractions are really, really important to help you resolve a fraction so that you can go and do integration. And that's going to be emphasized later on in one of the later lectures. All right, now let's go back again and say to ourselves, how do we reduce to a proper fraction? So we notice this, this is top heavy. My suggestion is to write iterations of that denominator at the top, ensuring that we're gonna get exactly the same expression. So I said to myself, okay, if I've got an x plus three, to get a 2x squared, I had to have a 2x at the front. This gives me 2x squared, and I'm happy. This now is going to give me 6x, but I needed minus 4x at the top, so I know that I have to have minus 10 at the front of that bracket. Because then that minus 10x and that plus 6x gives me the minus 4x. And if I keep playing around, I'd say to myself, okay, distributing in here is minus 30. But to get to plus 13, that had to be a plus 43. So over here, I have the same expression written in a different form. It has the same value. But now I can divide every single term in the numerator by the denominator. And that then is going to give me this expression. And again, I've, I've already shown a little bit earlier on, this is really powerful to be able to convert this improper fraction into a proper fraction. Well, first of all, there's nothing further to do in terms of the partial fraction. So this has worked out really nicely. But it has a huge benefit as well. 
Because if I go and look at this and I say, what happens when the limit of x tends towards plus or minus infinity, we should recognize that this red part will tend towards zero. So at its extreme values, far right, far left, the function actually tends towards this linear function. And if we just go and look at the graph, okay, so I've drawn the graph, and now I'm going to superimpose on top of that the line 2x minus 10. We notice that that is the oblique asymptote. So when you reduce an improper fraction into a proper fraction, this whole part over here is always going to be the oblique asymptote. Now let's go into complex numbers. Okay, just a couple of points. The definition of an imaginary number. I hope that you're very comfortable with that. Also, if you've got z is equal to a plus b r, this z star is the conjugate. And what we notice is that it's the sign of the imaginary part that must change. And then we need to be able to add, we need to be able to multiply, we need to be able to divide. And I'm going to take you through one example of each of these so that you can perform the basic operations. Okay, so if we're given k and g, and I ask you to add g and k, just remember you're going to be adding the real parts with the real parts, the imaginary parts with the imaginary parts, and then we get our solution. And that's a useful technique when solving for unknowns. Remember that you equate the reals to the reals and the imaginary parts to the imaginary parts. Now over here, if we are going to go and multiply, but just look carefully at my question, because my question is saying, form the product of GK, but I only want the imaginary part of the solution. So just understand that notation. So I go and FOIL it. I just do normal distributive law. But please remember that when I go and multiply and I get r times r, which is the r squared, r squared by definition is negative 1, which is why we then get positive 20. And then if you just rearrange, adding the real parts of the real parts and the imaginary parts together, we know that the imaginary part is the coefficient of the r, which is then going to be 19. And then over here, let's go look at division. So we're saying k divided by g. When we are dividing and we get a complex in the denominator, we always multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. I'll just kind of say that again. We want to multiply the denominator by the conjugate. And of course, then we're going to do the same to the numerator so we don't change the value of the fraction. The reason why we do that is because then we've created a difference of two squares meaning we just have to multiply the first to the first and the last to the last. So when I go the first to the first, the negative 1 times negative 1 is plus 1. Then I've got 5r times 5r, which is 25r squared, but there would have been a negative. So negative 25r squared makes it positive 25. And then I've just distributed the top. We've already seen okay, a, a product, so I don't want to go through this product here again. Let's just remember that 20r squared takes us to negative 20. We go rearrange, and now we just divide each component of the numerator by the denominator so that we can separate the real and the imaginary parts. So in the exam, there's a chance that you may get something like that. But more than likely, we're going to be solving equations with some clues given in. So again, if we're playing with nature of roots, if we're being asked to solve, if someone asked me to solve that, I'm not going to go anywhere else but my calculator. Go straight to your calculator, make sure you're in complex mode and let your calculator throw out the roots. But it's also very important to know that if you are going to get a complex solution, you're always getting the conjugate as well. And that is very, very powerful and something that you must use when solving equations. So here's one such example. This is a, a perfectly typical exam question. So if x is equal to negative 3 minus r, and that's a solution to the equation, determine the other solutions. Okay, so think about that. And then the value of p. If you're not watching this live, I'd suggest that you pause the video right now and then try this yourself and see how you go. So if this is a solution, there is always going to be a complex conjugate, which is also a solution. So straight away, all of us should be saying negative 3 plus i is another solution. Now, from the fact that we've got the solutions, we go back and we go and form the, the factors of the expression. 
So we know that we can take them back into the brackets to form the factors by changing their signs when we bring them back. Um, there are very clever ways of solving here. And in my own classes, I talk about the sum and product of roots. And I know many schools do that as well. But another clever thing that students sometimes do is if we rearrange and we bring this back, this becomes x plus 3 plus r. And this becomes x plus 3 minus r. And I think a, a clever thing is to recognize that you're always going to get here a difference of two squares. So you can just multiply the first to the first and the last to the last. And very, very quickly, take your two factors and multiply out. You're going to get x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus r squared, which is plus 1. And you should be able to get there almost by inspection. Now, if each one of these roots, which we've taken back, gives us factors, then we know that this part over here is also going to be a factor of our original expression. Okay, so there's the original expression, and now we've got to say to ourselves, let's form the other part. Again, it's up to you the method that you use. I quite like inspection because I'm always trying to work as quickly as possible in AP. So I'd say to myself, there's definitely an x squared because we get that leading term over here. If I've got the constant of 10 to get to minus 20, I know that there definitely is going to be a minus 2. And then you've got to say to yourself, all right, I'm either focusing on the x or the x cubed. And I'm saying to myself, what coefficient of x would I have over here so that I can get to these terms? Now, I've already done a little bit of work. So I'm just going to go to the next slide over here. And you're going to wonder, why was there no x term? Well, in the process of focusing on this minus 12x, I said to myself, okay, x squared can't multiply to anything to get an x term. But 6x would multiply to the constant. And then this 10 would have multiplied to the x. But if the 6x times by the minus 2 has already given me the minus 12x, which is all that I needed, then I know that I mustn't have an x term inside there. doesn't matter. In your own time, you can play around and have a look, but that was just an interesting example that I created here where there was no x term. Now we're close. Okay, remember we said go and solve. So we were solving this thing. They said, what are all the solutions? Well, we knew from the original that one was given, and so we must go and give the complex conjugate. But if x squared minus 2 is equal to 0, then we know that x would be equal to plus or minus root 2. And then again, they wanted me to find the p part over here. Don't go multiply everything. You're saying to yourself, you want the coefficient of the x squareds. So let's go and have a look here. 10 times x squared is 10x squared minus 2x squared will give me 8x squared. And so the coefficient of that x squared p is going to be 8. All right, that ends part one. Have a brief stretch, and I'm going to get into lecture part two shortly.